All right, it's it's finally fucking happening. I'm gonna review this goddamn movie. You know, in a way, this channel was kind of born for this review. Um, you know, Old Boy is easily the most famous and well-received Korean film, you know, ever. And this channel started out talking about um, movies. I'm not really sure what the fuck it is now. Uh, but it definitely started out talking about movies. And, you know, I'm Korean, as far as I know. As long as there's, like, no big conspiracy theory behind my birth, I'm Korean. So, it totally makes sense that I'm reviewing this movie at least at, at, at a certain point, and it might as well be now, but there's a reason why I haven't reviewed this movie up to this point, and there's a re reason why I'm reviewing this movie now. Um, the reason why I haven't reviewed it up to this point is because I've only seen it once, and I saw it when I was really getting into movies for the first time, so I was like watching every single film in the IMDb Top 250, and I was really surprised when I saw Old Boy, because I was just like, oh my god, there's a Korean movie in this list. What the fuck? Like, right next to Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, there's, like, this Korean film that even my dad, not like everybody around me knows about. And I saw it um, for the first time when I was 12. So, outside of the twist and some, like, the basic stuff you can talk about the movie when it comes to, you know, like, the acting and whatnot, I had no idea what to talk about the movie. Like... I didn't notice the stylistical, the aesthetic aspects of the movie. I didn't really know how to talk about the themes of the film. And, and the reason why I'm reviewing this now is because, if you haven't noticed, Old Boy is now 15 years old. It's now a bratty teenager. Um, and it's being re-released in theaters in Korea right now. It, it, and... The run is already over. Like, it lasted for about four fucking days and it's gone. But thankfully, I was able to catch, catch it within those four days. It, um, by the way, um, Bong Joon-ho's Memories of Murder is also being re-released. It's also gone now, but I, I wasn't able to catch that one. But I still, I wanted to catch Old Boy because I want to know, you know, what the film would be like to me now. Now that, now that I'm more mature, now, now, that I've, now that I know more about movies... And now that I know how to analyze films more, you know, in a, in a much more efficient and somewhat um, more technically efficient way, would this film be as great as it is, can, you know, perceived for, in, in, you know, in, in, all over the goddamn world? And I watched it, and everybody's absolutely correct when they say this is probably one of the best movies of the 2000s. Um, it's really good. It's, it's, it's really, really fucking good, and I'm, I'm gonna get into the thematic aspects a little bit, a bit later, I want to get into the stylistic aspect of the movie first, and I want to get into, like, some of the more surface level stuff, because there's a lot to talk about from both sides of the spectrum, so we'll, we'll get to the thematic stuff later, but, um, a lot of the really stylistic Asian movies of this time, you know, around the late 90s and the early to mid-2000s, they were all mostly influenced by Wong Kar Wai, in my opinion. Even though Wong Kar Wai was technically, like, a part of this generation. But, you know, when you look at some of the close-up shots, when you look at the color scheme, when you look at the transitions and the montages, you're instantly reminded of, like, Wong Kar Wai style. But what Pak chan does with this movie is that he kind of mixes in that Neo-Tokyo-styled you know, aesthetic, the manga aesthetic that the film is supposed to have, and he mixes that Korean off-kilter sense of humor in there and makes it almost like this strange hybrid of a movie that works so well, even though it really shouldn't. Like, um, the enhanced quirkiness of the Neo-Tokyo style is seen through the manga-style aesthetic of the movie. Like, some of the shots are, like, straight out of a goddamn manga, like... There's that scene at the end where Desu is like standing next to this painting of a tsunami and the lighting lighting is like all red and pinkish. And that's like straight out that's straight out of the manga, you know, like Mido praying you know, kinda of in that you know, on the bed, in that praying position, the same position that um the woman in the painting is in, like right behind her. Like that's straight out of the manga, like that's kinda of like the quirky sense of humor that the film is trying to portray portray. 
<laughs> and um, then there's that scene where Mido is like stretching out her arm to like give Desu like a piece of fried dumpling. And that like there's that over the top almost anime style body language that's going on. But, this, but the shot that really reminds me a lot of a lot of the manga aesthetic that the film's trying to go for is that scene where Desu is holding um, the tie of the guy who's trying to jump off the building. And you see a further away shot of them, and they're like more on the right side of the screen. And you see that you see like Desu's shadow all over, and it's really dramatic. The music's really upbeat and dramatic, and almost like victorious. And that is definitely like old school anime style. That's like old school manga style, and it 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 looks amazing. Like it, it gives a sense of personality to the film, and the look of the characters too. Like the the look of Desu. Um, feels really industrial punkish, like the stuff, the kind of stuff that you would see in maybe like, like Tetsuo and whatnot. And the look of Mido is like very '90s anime heroine-ish, but at the same time, it reminds me a lot of the stuff that was seen in like Chunking Express. Um, like again, like we we go back to Wong Kar Wai here. A lot of the look really comes from Wong Kar Wai and anime and all that stuff. So it's like a mix of a lot of ideas. But then, you know, especially that scene where Mido is, like, in that... When Mido's, like, helping out Desu for the first time, and she's in that shot with the old lady, and there's that one shot where she's, like, right in the middle of the shot, and you just see her, and she doesn't really say anything. She just kind of laughs off something that the lady says, and that's, like, the perfect image of what I think of when I think of Mido. Like, the 90s anime heroine styled makeup, hair, the clothing very much so reminded me of, stu of some of the stuff that Maggie Chung was like wearing in her movies with Wong Kar Wai. Um, yeah, the look of the movie's great. And by the way, if, you, if you're like an international audience watching this movie, there's like small references in this movie that you might have not noticed. Um, like uh, when you go into Mido's apartment, there's like a bunch of VHS tapes under, the te under her television. And you, because the VHS tapes... Um, the titles are written in Korean, so some of you might not know which films those were. And I'm just gonna, I'm here to tell you that I've noticed two of the movies. So one of the movie was, it's technically a TV miniseries thing, but um, it's Lars von Trier's The Kingdom. And the other one was Jean-Pierre Genet's Delicatessen. And I feel like that's, that was, those two movies were very intentional because the look of the film... And some of the scenes very much so reminds me of what Jean-Pierre Jean Jean -Pierre Genet did in his movies. You know, like some of the over-the-top close-up shots. You know, like the, the distortion of reality feeling that goes on in, in some of the sequences. It's definitely a lot. There's like a lot of Jean-Pierre Jean -Pierre Genet influence there. And there's like that really trippy flashback scene where Desu's like seeing himself in the past running around the school like that's definitely like Lars von Trier style of creating trippy sequences like it looks amazing and those you know those references were on point even though they were subtle as fuck and I like the fact that um the film like like it really plays around the audience's comfort zone when it comes to predictability and having you know, this feeling of safety, of having a personal space, almost like on a David Lynch level, like, obviously there's the twist, but we'll get to that later, like, the other scene would be, like, the hotel scene where we see Tessu and Mido sleeping, they just had sex and they're sleeping, and then Eugene comes in and, and he has a gas mask on and he's like touching Mido's body slowly and like the, the white haired bodyguard is standing next to him and like that's straight out of fucking Blue Velvet. Like that's straight out of Blue Velvet. The walls reminds me of um, a lot of the, the decoration done in like Twin Peaks. Um, and, like, the white-haired bodyguard, he's basically, like, a mix of Dennis Hooper's character, um, and Blue Velvet and the Mystery Man Lost Highway. So, like, there's a lot of David Lynch influence here, and he uses it well. Like, it feels genuinely disturbing. And there's another, like, there are, there's the sex scenes in this movie, like, they're so, they're so lengthy, and they the movie lingers on those scenes for such a long time that it eventually 
becomes very uncomfortable to watch. Like, especially the scene where Eugen is having sex with her with his sister. Like that scene lasts for a for a handful amount of time. And at a certain point you're like, oh my god, like this is this is incest. And I'm not really sure how to react to all of this, but it lingers on and it's like emphasizing just what's going on and you feel every fucking breath from those two people and it feels fucked up, but that's intentional. Like, that's what Pak chan is going for in that scene. So the film is, like, clearly not saying that this is a safe movie. No, we're going to challenge you here to stay sane. Um, and the film has a very off-kilter sense of humor, which I usually appreciate in Pak chan movies. Like, um, like, the guy who's trying to kill himself eventually kills himself. Like, you see the body falling on the car... And everybody's in a panic, and Tessu's like just smiling away. And it like it's hilarious, but it's dark as fuck. And there's that um right like right after the twist. Right after the twist. And by the way, I'm gonna spoil this movie. Like, I'm gonna spoil everything about this movie. So please, if you haven't seen the movie, don't watch this review. I'm probably gonna put in but put like spoilers and capital letters in the title anyways, but please, if you click this, if you click on to this video, despite having not seen it, stop here. We're gonna, we're, I'm gonna spoil everything, and it's very important for you to not know the twist. Um, so, like, right after the twist, like, right after Desu learns that, here's the twist, Mido is his daughter, you know, there's that scene where Mido's like, in that room that where Desu was stuck in for for 15 years and she's wearing the those angel wings that Desu bought for her when she was like four or eight or something and she's just like sitting there with the angel wings and she's like doing this to make the wings flap and it's like a sudden change of you know atmosphere and the wings obviously indicate that Mido's the daughter even though the twist already happened and the wings kind of brings this sense of unease to the scene but then she like does this to make the wings flap and you're like it's so off kilter but it's hilarious because you're like suddenly you suddenly get out of that uncomfortable place and you're like oh there's that awkward sense of relief but it's still fucked up and it, it's just great and like the the great use of inner monologue again inner monologues the off kilter sense of humor exists there and there's just these small moments in that hallway fight scene. The, those, there's these small moments in that scene where even though it's violent as fuck, even though it's tense as all hell, it's also really, really funny. Especially that last part where, like, there's that big guy who's, like, kind of limping, and he's the only one who's standing, and Des is, like, slowly walking up to him. The big guy's, like, like he doesn't know what to do because he's seen what Des was capable of doing. And he's, like, he throws a punch, but he, Des is just, like, you know, he, he ducks away quickly, and he just punches the fucking guy to the ground. Like, it's, 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 it's hilarious, even though his tense is all fuck. Um, and of course the film's just like intense, just like, in, just packed full of intensely impressive scenes. The hallway fight scene, again, tense as all hell, also very funny. Like, while I was watching that in the theaters, when all the sound was happening to me, like, I accidentally, like, 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 pulled up my fist just like that, like, out of nowhere, because I was so into that scene. Um, like, the, the flashback scene with the... With the with Desu like in the process of recovering his memory, seeing his own past right in front of him, um, the conversation that Eugen and Odessu has before the twist is so well shot. It's you know like like they're talking through their reflections and it's fractured and it's strange, and it, and it's just such good fucking symbolism. It's amazing. Um, I got a lot to say, so there's like a lot of memos here, um, and. As long as we're getting into sim symbolism and whatnot, I mean, I guess we we should get into the theme. But before we get into the theme, I want to just like I feel like we should really appreciate how many cliches this script avoids because there are many there are so many ways this film could have been bad. Like um, like Eugen. At first, when you're introduced to him, you're like, 
oh, he's just like this overly calm, Bond villainish antagonist that sees everything as a game, and he's 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 he talks in riddles, and he's just this cliche. But no, like not only by the end do you feel for him, you know there are scenes where he shows intense vulnerability, like this very intense sense of unhingedness, especially in that scene in the PC cafe where you know he see he listens to Desu's best friend talking about. You know, Eugene's sister and, you know, calling her a slut and whatnot. And you see just how insulted he is. You see how much Eugene is insulted in that scene. And he breaks that CD and kills the best friend in that scene. You don't see this calculated villain. You see a little kid who's just so infuriated by what he's just heard. And, you know, those scenes, the, really that that's... um. That that's a lot of credit that that should be given to the acting. I I don't really remember the name of the actor who played Eugene, but he's really good. He 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 should really be within the conversation um, alongside Tremishik playing Desu, and the like. The film could have also been like a really generic Lolita style relationship movie, but obviously like the twist completely turns it over and makes an intense tragedy out of it, and. Another way this film could have been um, mediocre, not necessarily bad, but just like average and whatnot, um, is that it could have been the tragedy, the, the, because the film really is a tragedy. The tragedy could have been very one-sided. The tragedy could have been only on Desu's part, but by the end, both the antagonist and the protagonist um, are completely broken people. Um, both Desu and Eugene is revealed to be very broken people and very much so in the wrong on both sides and I feel like that makes the film more dynamic there's more depth to it after that now thematically the obvious comparison to make would be to the story of Oedipus Rex you know like even in the movie like instead of his eyes you know Desu gets rid of his tongue uh, from the con consequence of learning and, at, you know, actively looking for the truth. And we can really talk about that all day. But I want to talk about why the Oedipus Rex structure here feels more original than other movies. And why it's not just a complete ripoff of the play and whatnot. Like, here's the thing. Eugen, the, 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 vil the, the villain of the movie, um, he plans out a revenge... Um, that will make sure his own pain and his own tragedy will take shape in Desu's life. And I feel like that's why there's so much going on, more so than the Oedipus Rex structure. The, the revenge, the truth aspect of the movie is much more active and alive than the generic Oedipus Rex structure here. And the thing is, as the film goes on, you realize despite Desu's appearance, and despite Ujin's appearance... Eugen is technically in, he's technically the lower human being, morally at least. And his, within the process of his revenge, he brings Desu down to his level. Like, that's the process of this whole, you know, search for the truth and whatnot. Eugen plans this stuff out to make Desu realize what the truth is, and by making him learn the truth, he drags Desu down to his level. And that's why this Oedipus... Oedipus Rex, Rex structure here feels so original and feels like not like it's not just a ripoff. But I feel like outside of the Oedipus Rex theme, there's like two other themes that's really going on, and one of them is really that really the financial differences when it comes to the middle class and the top one percent in Korea. I feel like there's a lot of that going on because of how the revenge is you know done in the movie. Because here's the thing. Eugen blames Desu um, for everything, obviously, for the death of his sister, for making um, him, you know, making his life bas basically a complete tragedy. However, he never blames himself. You know, he he, and I feel like he does this because he can afford to justify justify his position. He can afford to justify the fact that justify this idea of Desu being in the wrong. But if you really think about it, nothing Desu did um, to provoke the events of the movie 
were intentional. None of it was intentional. Like, him telling his friend about seeing Eugene having, having sex with his sister was just like this random thing he said. He didn't really think much about it. He wasn't saying that to ruin Eugene's life. No, he just said it because he, he you know, it's his friend. He, they were just having a conversation. But everything that Eugene does to provoke the events of this movie were intentional. In many ways, even though Desu's kind of kind of a fucked up person, you know, in his own right, when you see the beginning of the movie, that's very clearly the case. Um, in many ways, the events of the movie in general, that's all Eugen's to blame. And yet, Eugen blames Desu, and he justifies this all that, and he, he's able to afford this entire revenge because he's rich. And I feel like that's, like, a lot, there's a lot going on there when it comes to social commentary on, you know, the, the economy of Korea and the, the class differences in Korea at, at the same time. And, but, but I like the fact that by the end, like, when he gets his revenge, like, when Ujin finally gets his revenge, all that blame that he was thrown to Desu eventually turns to him. And he realizes the realizes the truth and he's like able to let go symbolically through a flashback he's able to let go the memory of his sister and when he finally does he realizes how much of a monster he has become at, at the same time and that's why he kills himself and that's why the movie's so fucking good like the structure is this poetic tragedy that works so well and I feel like a lot of the Another thing that the movie's also trying to go for is this sense of having a fractured existence when it comes to being a modern man or just like a modern person in the world. But like because you know, in in a way, Mido is also like included in that theme as well. Like his life in itself has become vengeance, both Eugen and Desu. Like the past haunts him. The past haunts the both of them. Um, the worst sides of themselves become their whole. And their compass, their moral compass, doesn't come from their morals at all. It comes from hatred. It comes from, you know, habit, habitual sense of revenge. And I feel like a lot of that is shown not only throughout the movie, like in the script and whatnot, but uh, I feel like the music, that waltz, that music really represents that theme, like that sense of ruthless aimlessness. Um, that's ultimately very lonely and very sad and very just soul-crushing. I feel like that music really represents that. Um, and I feel like a lot, all, all these themes and all this great sense of poetic tragedy that's going on is shown through the acting. If the acting wasn't this good, none of this would have been that, that effective. Like, Chemin Shake, fuck man, like, his Desu is fucking intense like not only is it for not only is he first still here like obviously he can play the dry humor he can pull off the dry humor he can pull off the crazy but my favorite scene of his acting in this entire movie is when he learns about his relationship with Mido and he gets a call from Mido and he's and Mido's like there's a box in front of me and should I open it and Desu's like he's desperately trying to stop her from opening the box and while he's talking to Mido in that scene, he suddenly... Okay, so the camera turned off by by itself. I don't know why it did that. Um, I'm just gonna, like, slab these two reviews, these two videos together. So, like, that in that scene where Desu is talking to Mido, and Mido's like, oh, there's a box in front of me, should I open it or not? And, you know, Desu's, like, desperately trying to stop Mido from opening the box. And... In the process of talking to her, he completely throws away that facade he had of have, being this lonely monster of modern society, and he suddenly talks like he's the father. Like there, there's a certain phrase that in Korea where where parents use when they are talking to their kids to make them stop crying, and that phrase is "duk." Like "duk" means stop, stop doing that. Now come on, let's, let's stop crying. Crying's not that good. Let's 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 put a smile on that face. That's that's the phrase that we use in Korea, duk. And he constantly says that, and he starts talking like a father. And in that scene, the tragedy of the whole movie 
really comes into full focus and you feel so bad for the guy and you feel so desperately for the man and that scene just broke me like I was on the verge of crying when I saw that scene because that's how much the tragedy feels so tangible it's so effective um, and the guy, like again the guy who plays Eugene there's we should credit him as much as Tremishing in this movie because like, um, he basically plays the same character as Desert, but it's much more calmer, it's much more subtle, but at the same time, it's not, like, overly plastic. You sense the vulnerability, you sense the unhingedness in him, within him, too, and it's effective as well. And, of course, Mido, Kang Hejong playing Mido, like, she's charming, she's funny, there's that sense of innocence there, which emphasizes the tragedy at the end as well. And, like, all of this, the acting, the way the film is structured, the style, all of this comes together to give you a tragedy of a movie that's so anger-inducing. Yet, you know, you, you, it's understandable from both sides, and, like, it really almost made me cry because I was so mad, and I was so upset, but at the same time, I understood exactly what Eugene was trying to do, and in a way... I was almost able to relate to him. Like, Eugene is such a human villain that the whole process of revenge is both anger-inducing and understandable. And that's something that most movies aren't able to do. Um, like I said in the beginning... Uh, well, I haven't said it. Um, I, I only have one problem with this movie. One single problem. Is, and it's the fact that at times... It overly depends on the inner monologue that Chen Mishik's character, you know, Desu's having in the movie. Even though the acting is clear, clearly doing enough of a job to convey the emotions and the, the angers and whatnot that the character's going through. You know, the film, there's a lot of inner monologue in this movie. And when it's trying to be comedic, it works well. When it's trying to explain the inner goings of, a, of Desu's character... It's not necessarily um, essential because the acting is clearly doing all of that. You know, it's doing enough of a job when it comes to showing us how Desu is. But outside of that, this movie's really good. Like, there's no reason why you shouldn't watch this movie. It's so, it's so good. Jesus Christ. So yeah, that's my old boy review. I know it's long. I, I had a lot to fucking say. The movie's great. The movie's fantastic. Everybody should watch it. And there you go. It finally happened. Blah.